Hey everyone, nice to see you again, or thanks for joining for the first time. My name is Barton Seaver. Welcome back to our weekly series on, uh, well, seafood and, well, just, well, all things cooking here on Ruby Thursdays, every Thursday, 11 a.m. Uh, Pacific Time, 2 p.m. Eastern Time. I'm thrilled to be back with you this week. Uh, last week, I wanted to say uh, thank you to uh, my colleague Ken Rubin over at Ruby for taking over the Grilling Vegetables uh, edition because, well, my wife and I had our second child that day, uh, a week early and a uh, bit unexpected, but very welcome and mama and son are doing incredibly well and big brother Alden is uh, taking to his helpful role uh, like a champion and, well, hey, Life is good, and if we couldn't, you know, all use a, a bit of bright spot and hope in, in this crazy time, uh, I'm, I'm very happy to have it. So, anyway, uh, to start off with, uh, as you know, I like to, those of you who joined us before, say what I'm thankful for, and, uh, well, hey, the Red Sox are opening their season tonight. That is something I am very thankful for. I am recording this a day ahead of time because, well, I have a five-day-old child, as well as a four-year-old, as well as a wife to take care of, and uh, yeah, so the vagaries of all things, uh, that being. So I'm recording here, and uh, I appreciate all of you sending in your questions and comments. It's nice to see so many familiar names pop up. There's some great questions, and what we're going to be doing today is I'll answer m most of those questions just to camera here, but I've got a number of visuals that we'll also show. Uh, and then some of the dishes that you asked me to make, I've got a, uh, we'll do a video of me cooking that. I know I'm, or we're going to be putting lobsters on the grill, showing you how to do that. Uh, we're, uh, yeah, I think a couple others. Well, and we'll get to them as we get down to the questions. So anyway, I'm looking forward to this. Thanks for your questions. And here we go. So from Andrew in Portland, Maine. I'm not the cook of the family, but I am the dishwasher. Do you have a good one pot pan seafood recipes to share? And bonus points if you can teach some tricks to avoid the smell in the house. Uh, yeah, you know, there's so much seafood that can be done uh, in one pot uh, and to avoid the smell. Let, let's start with avoiding a smell on seafood. Bottom line is buy good seafood. That's it, plain and simple. Uh, and whether that's good quality frozen seafood or whether it's Andrew, you're in Portland, you say so. Going down to Harbor Fish, getting something there. Uh, but what you want to avoid is high heat methods that are going to vaporize a lot of fat uh, and moisture. So saute. And think about what you do when you saute, right? Maybe you get little splatters all over your stove after you're done, right? Well. All of that was aerated, and that's what you're doing, is you're creating just a plume of aroma that's going to end up in and around your house. Whether that seafood is fresh or not, uh, you still are going to end up with a smell. I think the smell is great. Uh, so lower heat methods, baking is a really great one. Uh, poaching is a fabulous one. Uh, and if you've been on any of these webinars before, you know that I am a huge fan of uh, cooking in the toaster oven. So slow bake, slow roast in the toaster oven. Um, and for a one pot meal, what I really like to do is start off with a sauce, maybe a you know, cast iron pot uh, pan, like a lodge pan. Uh, you go out to Rennie's, you have one of those, the main reference for you there. Uh, get it smoking hot, throw in a bunch of uh, chopped zucchini olive oil, let that color just a little bit, throw in a pint of cherry tomatoes. As soon as the cherry tomatoes then begin to release their liquid into the pan, throw a couple of pieces of seafood on top and throw the whole thing in a 300, 325 degree oven and just let it cook for whatever amount of time is needed. If you're talking about a big thick chunk of salmon, uh, you're talking probably about 12 to 15 minutes. If you're talking about sh peeled shrimp, you're talking probably six minutes max. If you're talking flounder fillets, four to six minutes. So just gauge by the temperature there and the thickness of your fillet. But the other thing to consider is that you have heat coming from the bottom as well as from the top because you have all that hot vegetable which is now steaming your fish from below as you're cooking in the ambient temperature of the oven. Uh, one other dish that I really like to do is a shrimp boil. And up here, obviously, we eat a lot of lobsters, but a shrimp boil is really fun. Uh, but to do it on a sheet pan in the oven. So get a bunch of potatoes, slice them up, boil them. So there's two pots, sorry. So boil your potatoes and then uh, slice them, big thick slices, 
and get a nice big sheet pan hot in the oven, about 425, 450, olive oil or uh, canola oil, whatever on the bottom. And then throw your potatoes down, take chunks of corn uh, that you cooked either with the potatoes or just raw, uh, get a bag of pearl onions from the freezer section at the store already peeled, uh, throw those on there frozen. Uh, throw on a giant heaping handful of a uh, couple pounds of uh, frozen shell on shrimp. Season it up with Old Bay, throw on some more oil over top, throw some bay leaves or other herbs on there, and just throw the whole thing in the oven for about 20 minutes. There you go. And come out. You got the whole sheet tray right there for you. So it's a nice presentation. It's a nice dish. Uh, and just kind of a fun way to get a classic dish onto your table. Hey, Andrew, thanks so much. I hope that we uh, cross paths, maybe down at Harbor Seafood sometime. So thanks for joining from Portland, Maine. Awesome. So next up, we have uh, a question, not really framed as a question, but how to grill small fish like sardines and mackerel. Now you're, you're talking my ball game here. That's uh, some of my very favorite foods. So small silver fish, sardines, mackerel, anchovies, herring, alewives, they all have very high amounts of fat in them. And they also have very thin skins, generally. And so grilling them can be a challenge. Also, because they're small, well, you don't want to cut them into fillets all the time because you're going to lose so much yield on them. And filleting up little sardines is, it's worth it, and, and a fun, elegant uh, dish if you do. But part of the joy also is that they're these wonderful little sort of fish on the bone, fish on the cob kind of things. and. You can take whole sardines, uh, whole mackerel. You want to score the skin just a little bit. You actually go all the way down to the bone, really giving it something, some space for the fat to render out uh, into the grill, which is going to give you all that flavor as the fat falls into the fire and singes and comes back up. Because the cooking time is going to be so short, you want to maximize the flavor impact so deep gashes or, or slashes on the side of the fish. And then marinade. I do a, a marinade of uh, fine chopped shallots, tarragon, thyme are herbs that go particularly well with fatty fish. You don't need a whole lot of oil, just enough in the marinade to kind of make it a paste so you can get it over the fish. Uh, but the key is acid and citrus is, is king here. Uh, vinegars work well, white wine, red wine vinegar, champagne vinegar, sherry vinegar is great, but ci uh, citrus, adding that sweetness to it that, that is the hallmark of that, that sweet sour fruit is really gonna w what's going to make it shine. Whether you're talking about zest in the marinade or juice itself in the marinade, uh, or throw a whole halved lemon, uh, a halved lemon cut side down on the grill as you're cooking the fish. Uh, and that's going to char and burn, blacken, caramelize, get all stuck, seductive, sexy, rustic, yay! And so when the fish comes off the grill, you just squeeze that over and there's your sauce. Uh, in terms of getting the fish on and off the grill, uh, if the fish are very small, put a skewer in. If you filleted them, certainly put a skewer in. I've, I've got some photos here that I'm showing from one of my books, Two If By Sea, about that. Uh, but don't flip them more than once. Just let it cook on one side until it's charred, a little bit burned, the skin is peeled back from the grill grates and it's easy to slide a, a spatula just underneath and flip it right over. You want to be using a hot, hot grill and cooking directly over the flame the whole time. So another key, key, key here is when you put the fish on the grill, put them, tail or head, place the length of the body parallel to the grill grates. Because if you're going against them, you've got to go in between every single grill grate and get up there and you're going to you're going to lose a lot of fish. It's going to be frustrating. It's not efficient. But if the grill grates and the fish are the same, you come straight under it and you get a clean left off. All right. Cool. We're going to uh, I think get to a video question here. So, I'll see you in a second. Hi Barton, my name is Gary Chalk. I'm recording my question to you from the deck of our home in Southern Ontario near Toronto. 
Every year for probably 25 years, our family has vacationed in southern Maine. This year, because of the epidemic, we can't make it, of course. But we are looking forward to returning soon. When we do, can you provide some recommendations of some great restaurants, particularly in the Kennebunkport up through Portland area? Thank you. Good luck. Well, we would love to have you back when the border opens up again. And uh, tourism is a thing that, well, is possible. It's crazy. But, um, so Portland's restaurant scene is, is, is incredible. Uh, for such a small town, it was named uh, you know, Best Restaurant City of the Year by Bon Appetit Magazine a couple of years ago. And the pace of innovation and new interesting things has uh, not subsided at all. Uh, that they're just constantly new and amazing things to try here in Portland, Maine. But I, you know, I always go back to the classics. Uh, Four Street is hard to get into. I'm hard. It, it's not hard. You just got to put some effort into it. You got to queue up that day. They don't really take reservations uh, during the summer. The winter they do. But uh, you queue up at about 4:30 or so and get your name on the list, or you, you wait till they open at five and go stand at the bar uh, and get your table. But Everything is basically wood-fired cooking in there. They've got these giant wood ovens and, and big wood grills, and the whole place is sexy and seductive and just smoky and yay. It's the most attractive, handsome restaurant interior I've ever seen. Uh, the chef there, Sam Hayward, uh, is truly a legend. I consider him to be sort of the Alice Waters level, uh, the Alice Waters of the East Coast in terms of uh, what he's done for sort of local cuisine here. Uh, so Four Street, and that's your classic, uh, you know, appetizer, entree, dessert, restaurant, uh, rather than a tapas style. But their menus are ever changing and utterly seasonal and utterly innovative, yet so approachable and, and simple. Uh, our favorite place, my wife and I, where we go on dates when we get the chance to, is a place called Honey Paw, and this is uh, one of the three restaurants by the group that does Eventide and Hugo's as well. Uh, even tied the James Beard award-winning Oyster Bar, Hugo's, just an incredible, incredible uh, fine dining race uh, place. But um, Honey Paw is, I gotta say, I still don't understand the food there, other than the fact that it is astoundingly delicious. And there's Southeast Asian flavors uh, used in, in ways, dishes that I, I'm not familiar with. I'm not uh, fluent in that cuisine. So I don't recognize necessarily things on their menu as, as dishes that I would have some expectation towards, you know, the, the way you would with a, uh, you know, a, a butter chicken at an Indian restaurant. I just, I don't have that fluency there, uh, familiarity, but deep fermented flavors, lots of fish sauce, lots of fresh herbs, lots of chilies, just incredibly intricate con um, sort of constructions of dishes that ultimately eat very simply. They're not confusing, they're not uh, challenging, but they are so complex. And the flavors are, are developed in, in, in just the dishes, the way they do it is so rigorous that anything, everything on the menu is just astoundingly good. Uh, and always new, always uh, just such a departure from anything I, I regularly eat. Plus, they've got great beer, and I've got great friends there. They're just really friendly, awesome people. So uh, check them out. That's Honey Paw. Uh, let's see. Um, yeah. Why, why am I blanking on the name? Oh, good Lord. I haven't been out of my house in so long. Gilbert's Chowder House. That's it. Sorry. Gilbert's Chowder House, right down there on commercial. Uh for all the fancy places in, in Portland, for all the James Beard attention and Bon Appetit attention, Gilbert's Chowder House, man. Uh, <laughs> straight, as straightforward of a main seafood diner as you're going to get. Uh, always delivers, you know, thick, chunky chowder, fried clams, you know, the counter, counter service kind of thing, you know, just old uh, vinyl sided, uh, vinyl uh, chairs. It's just, it's perfect. It's absolutely perfect. You can get a bad cup of coffee, which is utterly great. You can get a cold beer. You know, as soon as your fried clam plate gets put up in the little kitchen window, the, the cook hits the, the bell there and ding, you know, it's, it is so perfect and the food is so good and so fresh and it's right on the dock. I mean, you're sitting on top of the water and they've just, they've delivered on quality uh, for decades now. So 
that's my that's my really my favorite like true authentic you know tried and true main place so there are many many others but uh that's a good selection for you hey gary thanks so much for your question and i really hope to see you here cheers all right, so I'm out here grilling in one of the uh, episodes, and I know that some of you have asked about how to fillet a fish in the past, so I just have this opportunity. I've got some a couple salmon in a box, so I want to take an opportunity to answer that question and to fillet. So you can use any different kind of knife really you want to. There's no hard, fast rule. Uh, I've got a flexible fillet knife. This is more like a boning knife, actually. This is uh, a meat knife for most folks. I've got a little shimtar. Uh, type thing, little 10 inch one. The only thing that matters about the knife you use is, is it sharp? And that's it. So sharpen them a little bit. Now the way that I cut salmon is called a straight cut. And that is that salmon have uh, slightly, well, thinner bones than most other fish, say like a cod, which are a lot tougher, especially those rib bones that stick up here. So you can just cut straight across this way and then go in and remove the bones as opposed to an up and over technique, which is to come down the backbone towards the, towards, uh, come down the spine, the, uh, the dorsal ridge here, towards the backbone, which runs throughout here, up and over those rib bones and then down and out. So that's a different fish, it's a different technique, um, and I'll show that at a different time, I just don't have a fish like that at the moment. So, take a knife, one of the things you want to do always is make sure that you're working close to yourself when you're filleting a fish. Last thing you want to be doing is being out here. You just, you're not controlling your hands well. Also, one of the big things is that sometimes you need to get your hand or your knife down on the board. And if your hand prevents the knife from being down there or being at an angle like that, you're literally setting yourself up for failure. So what we do here is we come in just at that backbone where it meets those rib bones. And as soon as you get through there, holding the belly flap up, and you don't want to rip it, you don't want to handle the fish uh, anything but gently, just push the knife all the way down and out. Do you see that? That's how I ended up. All I did was this. It's the advantage of a sharp knife. So watch this. I'm going to roll the entire fish over rather than lifting up the fillet, because every time you lift up the fillet, it's now no longer associated with those bones, right? and it can rip open. So I then roll that filet back over and look at that. Isn't that sexy? Right? And look at the color of that fish, by the way. Isn't that beautiful? So I'm gonna do that and then the way to finish this out, and you see how I always handle the filets with two hands. I'm not just never, ever, ever grab a fish by the tail, ever. You ever seen a fish swim backwards? Neither have I. They're not supposed to. Literally, <clears throat> literally, it breaks their physiology. At this point, you've got rib bones that come down and protect that belly. And I'm just coming in at an angle there. And this is where an a uh, slightly flexible knife really helps. And then I'm just following. I'm pushing with the back of this knife, not the front of the knife, the back of the knife, and allowing it to follow the curvature of those bones. See that? Very little meat left on there, and there's your rib bones, and I got all of them. So there is your fillet. At this point, you would just clean it up. You take out your pin bones, which are up here using pin uh, needle nose pliers or pin pliers, something like that, and those bones run just above that lateral line, about halfway through. If there's any fin fat or anything like that, just trim that up. Um, although it's not necessary because, well, it tastes good. So the only thing you really want to make sure you've done is trimmed off any of the, uh, any bones or anything that's there. So with that, that's how you fillet a salmon. Cheers. Hi, Barton. This is John Brawley from Sweet Sound Aquaculture in Charlotte, Vermont, uh, standing outside of my shrimp farm here at Nordic Farms in Charlotte. And my question to you about grilling lobsters is, do you prefer grilling them whole or slicing them in half and putting them on the grill or sectioning them out, crushing the shell a little bit here and there? Uh, growing up, I had lobster pots and we would always slice them down the middle and, and uh, grill them that way on a charcoal grill. Uh, just want to know how you uh, like to do yours. 
Thanks so much. Take care. Bye. A uh, question about grilling lobster was sort of what's the method for it? Do you grill it whole? Do you sort of break in the tail a little bit? Do you slice it in half? What? Uh, and my method for this is, well, I, I, I blanch them first, always. So I take the lobster, drop them head first into boiling water. Uh, and whenever you're cooking lobster, whenever you're dropping it into boiling water, it's absolutely essential that you drop them in head first. Why? Well, because a live lobster that's vigorous is going to flap its tail up in protest if you put its tail in the water. Guess what that does? It acts like a giant ladle of boiling water right onto you. So head first, plus that also helps to kill them faster. And I do believe that that is a humane enough way to go about dispatching the lobster. Uh, lobster meat, much like crab meat, sticks to the sh inside of the shell. So it is adhered there when raw. Uh, as opposed to a shrimp, which you can peel easily, a lobster you cannot peel in or remove the meat in, in a raw state without using some serious technology. So that minute in the boiling water is just to set the meat and kind of get it to remove or to release itself from that shell. Uh, also to set the meat in terms of well, it's going to have much more texture to it. You know what you're going to, what you, what you're dealing with, uh, and it'll be easier to work with. And then, head to tail. Take a tip of a knife, go straight down through the head with the tip of a big knife, and then rock the knife towards you. And in that way, you're you're cutting this as safely as possible. You're basically cutting well a hard shell, you know, animal. So it 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 can be quite dangerous. So tip down and then rotate it down like a lever. And that will slice right through the head of the carapace, uh, slicing it in half lengthwise. And then you turn the lobster around and you repeat the same thing using that knife as a lever coming down on it. And what that yields then is two halves of the lobster. Right behind the head is the sand sack. Uh, the sand sack is, well, it's the guts basically where all the bits of shell and whatever else, uh, indigestibles that the lobster has eaten, it gets trapped there. So you wanna remove that and it's fairly obvious what it is. Uh, and then if you're not a fan of the hepatopancreas or the old lady or the tamale as it's called, that sort of greenish, yellowish, uh, custard-like material that's uh, in the upper part of the body, you can remove that, but not necessary. I don't need a whole lot of it because it's not really healthful for us, but small amounts, you'll be okay, and it is pretty tasty. Uh, and then you also want to remove any of the digestive tract that runs down along the back, just as you would with a shrimp. So that's, the I think, one of the principal reasons why I like to cook them first, uh, blanch them first, is so you can remove that, but also just get in there, clean up the bits that you don't want. And then you've got your two halves, Cut side up, lay them flat on a sheet tray, brush them with oil. You really don't need much oil here at all. All you wanna do is just glisten <clears throat> anything that's going to touch the grill, which is going to be grilled cut side down. And then over a smoking hot grill, and I use charcoal or wood. Uh, you can, of course, you can use gas for this, uh, but you really need high, high, high heat. Uh, you place the lobster cut side down, parallel to the grill grates, directly over the heat and give it about two to three minutes only. And you're gonna see some flames. You're gonna see some of that tamale dripping down into the fire. It, it's going to lose some moisture, yes, uh, but it's gonna get so flavorful. It's gonna pick up so much smoke and deliciousness and all of that. Um, and in total, about a one and a quarter to one and a half pound lobster will cook on the grill uh, in about five to six minutes total, max. So you wanna do three minutes, searing high heat on the cut side and then flip it over. The meat should just release right from the grill. If you're cooking at a high enough temperature and you oiled it enough, it will release right from the grill. If not, fake it. Grab your tongs, pull up the whole lobster tail because it's not like fish. It doesn't flake apart. Pick up the whole lobster tail and just put it back in the shell. No one will ever know. Hey, I do it all the time. It's true. Um, and then what I like to do to finish it is put it over on the cooler side of the grill. I will then use that shell like a boat because, well, it's, it's intact. Uh, and I will lather the whole thing with flavored butter, like a garlic and tarragon butter. I'll put big pats of it in there and let it melt and sort of simmer down and the meat becomes bubbling and this lobster 
juices as well as this butter and just, oh, hot damn. Yeah, that's how you grill lobsters. But another thing about grilling lobsters is um, tr don't do it for a crowd. Uh, an, or at least don't do it for a crowd and expect to have dinner on the table all at the same time. It takes a lot of real estate in terms of your grill, in terms of the area that has access to that high, high heat. I mean, if you're trying to cook four lobsters all at once, you're going to need a very big fire with a very big flame. It's just more than you really want to manage. And also, they're really delicious at room temperature, just slightly warm coming off the grill. So cook them in batches. Don't try and force it. All right. Hey, thanks for your question. I really appreciate it. And I hope the, uh, the shrimp farm is doing well. So cheers. Hi, Barton. Uh, Shannon here from St. John's, Newfoundland. It's been raining here for the last three and a half days. Uh, and it's just, it gets to that point where the temperature drops so much that uh, I'm ready to start using my oven again in the middle of the summer or I'm ready to use my stovetop and I want a big pot of something really warm and delicious. How do you do chili? Um, I bought your book. I, I perused, but I'm busy uh, looking for a job uh, <laughs> like most people and uh, doing the Ruby course online. So uh, I haven't had a chance to take a look in here, but I'm assuming because this is seafood that you don't have a chili recipe in here. So we're asking about chili, but if you want to make it like a fish chowder, then that's cool too. Oh, congrats on squid number two coming. That's exciting. Anyways. All right. And the last question was, uh, uh, and forgive me, I don't have it in front of me, but a, a, a very charming YouTube question about chili and chowders on a cold day. Uh, and, and congrats on the nice background there. Yes, I was feeling that myself. It's July and here in Maine, I had to put on a giant sweater sweatshirt the other day. Anyway, I'm from south of the Mason-Dixon line. I'm not used to this. Shit. I'm not used to this cold weather, even in July, but we endure. And I actually myself made a giant pot of chili just the other day because when that cold weather kicked in, I just felt the desire. I just really wanted to stand over a long simmering pot of labor intensive, delicious love. And that is what chili is. Um, chili is also uh, sort of like the lullaby that your mother sang to you as a kid. It's wholly unique and no one else ever singing it to you will ever do it the right way. Chili is one of those dishes that it's just so unique to the person making it, what they prefer, how they do it. So I'm not gonna claim any superiority or have any of the answers on chili, but uh, you're right, there are no chili recipe, beef chili recipes in the Two If By sea cook, Seafood Cookbook. Uh, but just in general, to give you a sort of formulation of how I like to make chili, uh, chuck, beef chuck. So get a big old piece off the shoulder, get flavorful beef. <clears throat> Don't just go with the stew beef or whatever they've got conveniently cubed for you at the grocery store and don't use ground beef. It's totally fine to use ground beef, but you know what? I want basically like a beef stew. I want chunks of beef that are identifiable, that have that soft yielding texture, but still just that hint of that sear that you get uh, on it at the beginning of the process, but that simmers down, lending its beauty to the whole unctuous broth. Like that's what I want. So get a big old chuck roast, seam out most of the fat, leave some of it in there, uh, cut it into about half inch size pieces, maybe third of an inch, uh, and then season it with salt and then sear it. Super, super hard, get it nice and colored, and then pull it out. Don't worry about cooking it all the way through. All you're trying to do is just develop that flavor. Uh, and then to that same pot, you know, pour out the beef fat, anything that the, the beef was cooked in, it's, it's carcinerated, it's not gonna be very good for you, it's not gonna feel good. Add some new fat, cook in your onions, your garlic, your bell peppers, whatever ingredients you want there. And I don't cook them all the way down, but I do certainly wilt them. Nothing, I, I don't really like onions just simmered into something or bell peppers simmered into something. Develop the flavor. You're putting in all the time and money to make a big pot of love. Love it, right? So uh, saute them down, not to color them, just to wilt them down. Uh, and then add your spices. So the big key to chili for me is that the spices were toasted. 
So when you add your chili powder, when you add your cumin, when you add your ground coriander seed, when you add your smoked sweet paprika, that's the secret ingredient right there. Smoked sweet paprika makes everything better. Um, toast that in the oil. You might need to add a little bit more oil to give you some room to work with so that it, the spices are exposed to the oil. Well, and these spices are all, their flavors are fat soluble. And by toasting them, you bloom their own uh, volatile oils themselves. And so you just get so much more flavor out of it, as well as that flavor then carries throughout the dish, infusing into the broth, rather than just kind of sitting on top of the dish as this kind of disjointed flavor. This is such a key and fundamental part of making a good chili. You don't have to do it long. It's not a, you, you don't want to overcook them. You don't want to burn them. They can burn very easily. Uh, just 30 seconds over medium, medium high heat, stirring them constantly, just so you can begin to smell the aroma that changes. As soon as it changes, add your next ingredient, which is tomato paste. Tomato paste, you stir it in, it will immediately stop the saute aspect, the toasting of the spices because you're adding liquid. Um, they then just stir into the tomato paste and you cook that with the onions and the pepper or whatever else you have all together until the tomato paste itself uh, changes taste, changes aroma. Tomato paste is very acidic. It's very, even though it's, it's this heavy, thick, rich stuff, it's really bright and acidic in flavor. You need to cook that until it mellows. And as soon as that mellows, you have achieved balance in the base of your chili. So now whatever else you add to it, when you add the beef back, when you add your broth to it, uh, we can talk about that in a second, uh, the base of it is in balance. You've got your sweet and your sour of the tomato in balance. You've got your toasted spices, so the aroma and the flavor are in balance. You've got the depth and richness of the seared beef flavor. You've got the sweetness and the aroma also of the vegetables and sort of the, the flavor combinations there. So you're good at this point. At that, after this, it's just kind of combining ingredients. So throw your beef back in. I like to use beef broth, uh, low sodium one, so that you can control the amount of salt that you're putting in. Uh, and then I am a beans fan. I put beans in chili partially because, well, I want to eat a lot of it, right? And just a giant bowl of beef gets a little tiring. You need other things in there and beans, and it saves a lot of money. So there is my cold rainy day chili pseudo recipe. I really loved your video question. Thank you so much for sending that in. You are adorable and awesome and wonderful and I really appreciate you uh, participating. Cheers, thanks. Okay folks, so the last thing to do when uh, filleting is pin boning. As I was mentioning, you can use literally a needle nose pliers from the hardware store, which I'd like to use, or these little uh, pliers that are sold specially for this purpose, but those pin bones run, here's that lateral line as you see there, that line running right down the skin on the outside. So that's where the backbone was. And the pin bones run in a line just above that. And the way to get them is you just feel for them with your finger and kind of peel them out a little bit of the, of the flesh. And what you want to do is just grab them just below the surface and then pull towards the head of the fish. So you don't want to pull straight up. If you pull straight up, what you end up doing is ripping the flesh. You see like that? What you want to do is pull straight towards the head. And when you do that, they come right out of that little sleeve that they're in and they're easily removed. And you want to make sure that you get all of them. And there's, there's one about every, every flake. If you can see these lines of the flake of the fish in there, um, there's one between every one there. And as you see, as I go, I just, if you need to dig down a little deeper to get them, go ahead. It's better to get the bone out than it is to not have that little damage on the top, in my opinion. And when you get really good, you can get a couple of them out at a time. Nope. You can hear I'm kind of cutting that one down at the base. So, all right. So, there you go. That is removing the pin bones. All right, we got another question about grilling shrimp uh, from Shruti. Hi, Shruti, nice to see you. 
Did your name pop up again. Uh, can you please suggest some good ways to cook shrimp? Shell on or off? What type of marinade or dressing? Would, and what do you do to place it on to prevent it from falling through the grill? Cool. All right, let's talk about falling through the grill first. Uh, buy really big shrimp. That's one way to do it, right? Just bigger than the grill grates can't fall through. Uh, if that's not in your price range or they're not available, uh, certainly understood. And I actually like smaller shrimp on the grill better, I think. Uh, just more shell to meat ratio, and we'll get to that in a second. Uh, use a grill grate, uh, a grill basket, a colander, something like that. Just throw them all in. You want something that's flat, though, that has a, a wide surface area on the bottom so that you're getting the heat of the grill. You're not stacking the shrimp on top of each other. That's what you want to avoid. The other thing to do is simply throw them on skewers, and therefore you have a lot easier time of it because you're picking up five shrimp at once and turning them all at once, uh, placing them at once. So that, that's a great way to just to introduce some efficiency as well, uh, but also to make sure that they're not falling through. So shell on or shell off, both are fabulous, uh, but you're going to get two different outcomes in terms of the flavor there. When you grill the flesh of shrimp, it caramelizes, it gets a little bit of a rubbery texture to it, which I think is, is quite attractive and um, uh, an advantageous uh, you know, textural contrast to the sweet, tender meat inside, but that elastic snappiness to them is really nice. Uh, you do need to get high, high heat on that to really get the outside to kind of char or sear in time. Uh, and that, that's true for cooking with shell on. Uh, with shell off, a marinade is, is key, and a marinade uh, applied beforehand so that it has some time to cook in so the flavors are absorbed into it. I like to do uh, finely diced shallots, microplane garlic, fresh herbs, whether it's parsley, cilantro, tarragon, and then lime juice. Uh, very simple, and a little bit of olive oil just to <laughs> get it to spread like a paste. Uh, you don't need to marinate them for long ahead of time. It's not about infusing the flavor so much as it's creating this crust and flavor and charred little bits on the outside. Uh, so I would say no more than a half an hour really is necessary to get that great flavor for a shell off shrimp in a marinade. For shell on, the advantage to this and why I like them is A, it's a lot less work. It's cheaper because you're buying, you're not paying for the labor to get the shells off. And shrimp shells are edible. They're, they're delicious. And when they're small shrimp, in particular, you, they're a little bit softer. They're thinner shelled. So grilling over very high temperatures, they char, they burn, they add a completely unique flavor profile to the meat inside, while at the same time, they protect that meat inside from that high heat, yielding a nice, moist, sweet, soft, succulent bite on the inside. But when you snap down through that crunchy, slightly burned shell, you get this textural pop and contrast between the two, and you get this just incredible flavor contrast as well. And I mean, that's why you're using the grill to me. That's one of the great things that you can do. Otherwise, you know, just take the shrimp inside and saute them. It's easier, right? You just turn that on. You don't have to mess with starting a fire. That's one of the true, uh, sort of the best, highest and best uses of shrimp to me. And uh, those can also be marinated ahead of time, though I don't like to do that because what you're really trying to do is sear and char and slightly burn the shells. And so if you've got a marinade with lots of liquid in it in the form of fresh herbs or lime juice, which even though it's not a lot of liquid by volume, for a small shrimp that you're cooking, you're still it's reducing the time that you're going to have to char because you've got to boil off the the liquid in the marinade first before you really get that char. So instead, toss them in the marinade just afterwards. And so don't call it a marinade, just call it a, a bath or a sauce or a, a, you know, a tumble. And that same marinade that I was talking about earlier where it's, it's finely diced shallot, garlic, cilantro, lime juice, and a little bit of olive oil, and as soon as they come off the grill, put them right into a bowl with a marinade so the heat of the shrimp sort of blooms the flavors of the marinade, uh, slightly wilts the garlic and softens the, the pungent bite of that. And then, man, just 
just get after it. Your fingers are going to get dirty. Just, yes! This is what eating is all about. I mean, it, it, if we're grilling, we're outside, it's summer, or at least warm, or warm enough weather to stand out there. Celebrate it. You know, be out there. Get messy. Enjoy it. So, hey, Shruti, great to see you again. Thanks, as always, for tuning in and, and for your great questions. All right. Cooking frozen cod, or any frozen fish here, and this is coming from Brenda. So she says, I recently brought frozen cod fillets and fresh wasn't available. Pan searing was difficult as frozen fish is typically skinless. True. I used grapeseed oil and a hot nonstick pan. Uh, let's see, my fish stuck to the pan. Any, any uh, tips or techniques for you? Also, are the skins edible? Of course, uh, fish skin is edible. Uh, it doesn't always end up appetizing you have to apply a whole lot of temperature, a whole lot of heat to fish skin in order to get it to an appetizing texture. If it's just going to be sort of a flaccid, soggy thing that comes on your fish, it's not good to eat. It's good to cook with because it will help protect moisture in the fish. It will help uh, also add flavor and health benefits as well because of the sort of subcutaneous layer of fat or the layer of fat that's just underneath the skin. So you don't always have to eat the skin, but cooking with it is a benefit. I also just don't think that fish skin is necessarily worth it most of the time because the heat that you need to apply to say a salmon filet in order to get that skin super crispy is more heat than the flesh of that salmon than is really good for that flesh of the salmon. It will dry it out. I, I think that fish is best cooked at lower temperatures for slower, lower, longer periods of time. And if you're trying to crisp, you're doing the very opposite of that. And Now, don't get me wrong, there are absolutely delicious, delicious outcomes that are possible for, for crisping. And I, I'm not anti-skin uh, in general. I just tend to prefer to pay attention to the quality of the flesh as that's really the bulk of the enjoyment of the meal than I do to the quality and edibility of the skin. So to your frozen cod filet, uh, cod is a little bit different than say a salmon. And the reason for that is that the fat content. So cod is gonna have about a 3% fat content, about a 20% protein content. Whereas a salmon is going to have about 18 to 20 percent protein, but it's also it's going to have 14 to 20 percent fat. So what makes up the difference in those two fish is the salmon has that much more fat. Well, cod makes that up with water, and you're just you, you just have more water in those fillets just by physiology. So. A frozen cod fillet or halibut or hake or haddock um, and many other leaner white flesh fish, you're going to need to really, really dry them off. And that's key there. And now I am pro frozen seafood and pro frozen cod halibut when it's done well. And when it's done well, what that means is that it's been frozen at incredibly low temperatures very quickly. Because when ice freezes, it ex when water freezes, excuse me, it expands, right? And the slower you freeze water, the larger it expands. The faster you freeze water, it doesn't have time or to expand. And so it doesn't rupture the cell walls that house it. And with a fish like cod, that is incredibly important that you have a high quality IQF uh, flash frozen product. Thawed out first, you, you can cook, you can bake uh, frozen fish from frozen uh, cod, and that, that's a fine use of it. But for saute, you really need to thaw it out, thaw it out in the refrigerator, unwrapped, uh, placed between paper towels. Because any of that moisture that's exuded needs to be wicked away, to be removed. Because if you're trying to sear something, water and searing are opposites. To sear, you're applying dry heat to caramelize flesh. But if you have water there, you are now boiling off the water, which caps your temperature at 212. 
right? So you're not gonna get up to those high searing temperatures and it's that searing temperature that allows it to come free of the pan as well. So change out the paper towels, maybe once or twice if you're doing it overnight. Pat it dry, give it a little bit of pressure. Don't, don't kill it again, the fish is already dead. Just pat it dry, give it a little bit of pressure to squeeze out any moisture that's going to come to the surface and don't season it with salt before you cook it. Salt and sugar are humectants. They draw out water soluble, they draw out water to them. So when you put salt on a surface, what happens? Well, it begins to glisten, right? Because it's drawing out water from inside the filet. Don't do that. It's not necessary to season the filet ahead of time. You can season it effectively afterwards by sprinkling the salt on. It's a little bit more difficult, but totally possible. Same amount of salt. Uh, just apply it at a different time. Apply it in the same way. And in that way, you are managing all of your factors to make sure that there's as little moisture on the surface as possible, but you bought a piece of fish that has the moisture retention inside. Um, and use a little bit more oil than you necessarily otherwise would. And, and what you want to do there is get the oil really hot. It's not enough to get the pan hot, a, a thick pan that's going to hold its heat. You really have, <coughs> excuse me, you really have to get the oil hot as well. Uh, so that when you put it in the pan, give it a swirl. Just swirl it as soon as you put it in. Don't let it stick. Let the oil do the cooking for you so you, you sear, you, so that you cook those outside layers quickly in the oil as soon as you put it in. And therefore then now there's nothing to stick to because those proteins on the outside have already cooked. So, hey, Brenda, thanks so much for your questions. I hope that helps. Hi Chef, my name is Catherine and I'm a student in the professional cook certification course here at Ruby. Um, I just started out so I'm really excited to be able to ask you this question today, which is, do you have any advice for cooking seafood such as squid and octopus that tends to get a rubbery texture? How do you know that the food is done perfectly cooked? And do you have any favorite recipes or preparations for this kind of seafood? Thank you and I'm looking forward to hearing your answer. Yes, I, yes, I do. So squid is one of my very, very favorite of all seafoods. Uh, it was the, the one dish that I had on every single one of my restaurants uh, on the menu across the board in all seven restaurants was a dish of wood grilled calamari, wood grilled fresh squid with its purplish, beautiful skin still on. It was marinated in uh, microplane garlic, olive oil, and salt and then it was grilled over a super hot part of the this smoky wood grill and then it was served over a salad of frisee boiled potato boiled diced potatoes green beans and all of that tossed with a basil walnut pesto and uh, then the squid would just get put right on top of this voluminous crunchy just awesome salad and the basil smell was was just blooming off the entire thing and just filled the room with this incredible just you know just elegant sultry aroma uh, that's my very favorite of all the squid dishes sure I like me a calamari just deep fried you know red sauce it's absolutely delicious when done well uh, but what are the real benefits where the, the real beauty to squid is uh, when you can find it fresh and uh, fresh does not mean frozen and then thawed out but if you can find the whole animals, wow. It is a category of ingredient unto itself with incredible versatility. Uh, but the range of flavors that work well with both squid and octopus, uh, basil is incredible, garlic is incredible, tarragon, incredible, vinegar is great, uh, nuts, nut oils go incredibly well with them. Uh, and the other thing you want to pay attention to when designing a dish or con, uh, you know, sort of con, uh, constructing a dish is texture. So squid and octopus both have a snappy, elastic, toothsome bite to them when done well. Octopus, yes, can be super tender and melting. Uh, and so can squid if cooked for a long time. But if you're doing a quick to cook dish, you want to have something that is both going to sort of provide context for that texture of the snappy squid, which would be, say, a boiled potato, uh, whether it would be 
soft lettuce greens, like a, a mescaline mix, something like that, or soft herb leaves on the side. And then you also want to have something crunchy, whether it's uh, super thin shaved fresh shallots, whether it's a salad of shaved green beans, you know, raw or green beans cooked for just 10, 10 seconds even in boiling water. Something that's going to add crunch so that you have these sort of textural pops in there. Uh, and that way also you, you get these sort of uh, composed bites out of it. Uh, and, and that's what is, is really successful. Because to me, just eating a squid steak or an octopus tentacle doesn't really do it. I mean, yes, it's absolutely delicious, but it's really about integrating those other textures and flavors into a, a composed bite that really brings its beauty to uh, to sort of its best result, to its best level. Hey, can you all tell that uh, I have a five day or five day old child and I haven't slept at all? Because I just stare at him. I just stare at him all night, my wife and I, because he's, ah, he's beautiful. Little Rosie, by the way, his name is Rosie. Ambrose Lee Seaver, and we're going to call him Rosie. Anyway, okay, back to squid. Sorry. Sorry, Catherine. Uh, with squid and uh, cuttlefish, which is the other member of the cephalopod family, so the three of them, ce ce three cephalopods, squid, octopus, and um, cuttlefish, you got to cook them very quickly or cook them for a very long time, but it doesn't work in the middle. You can't cook squid for five to 25 minutes. It just doesn't work. You got to cook it really quick over very high heat or deep fry in really high heat till crisp, or you stew it for a long period of time. Now, squid, cuttlefish, octopus, all marry beautifully with tomato. So doing a stew uh, with a, a flavored tomato sauce is just really a, a tremendous combination and a great and elegant way to serve it. So whether you're doing cuttlefish or squid, cut them into bite-sized pieces. They do shrink down quite a bit. Sear them in a cast iron pan just to get some color. You're not trying to cook them through. And then just, you're basically just drop them in, let them sit for a minute and pull them out. And now you're going to have this beautiful fond or all of those caramelized juices on the bottom of the pan. Throw in onion, celery, uh, or fennel stalks, or fennel, uh, fennel bulb, a whole lot of fennel seeds. Saute that down in a whole lot of olive oil. Throw in a whole bunch of Calabrian chilies or arbo chili de arbols. You know, it's a, a flavorful but not punishing chili, uh, dried chilies. And then throw in a can of, you know, a, a one of those large cans of San Marzano tomatoes and just crush them up with a whisk or a spoon and just let that simmer. As soon as those tomatoes really break down, you're not trying to cook it into a Sunday sauce, you know, pasta sauce gravy. You just want this, as soon as those tomatoes break down and they no longer sort of smell or taste raw, that acidic bite to them, then you add your squid back in, turn the heat way down, put a top on it, have a glass of wine, take the top off, pour a glass of wine into the red wine too. Red wine's delicious with, with squid and octopus and stuff, cuttlefish. Have another glass of wine. Well, this is fun, right? Hey, I'm feeling good. Man, the house smells delicious. What is that? Oh, it's cool, honey. It's just the uh, the stewing squid and the chili bowl and San Marzano tomato mix with the uh, you know, caramelized fennel sauce. No. Oh. That sounds delicious. Crusty French bread, side salad of mixed greens, fabulous. The outlier here of the three is uh, octopus. Unless you're dealing with very small baby octopus, uh, it doesn't do well with very quick cook. So with that, you want to simmer it low and slow over many hours to sort of blanch it. <coughs> uh, and you want to get a pot of water, a, a pot that's going to fully submerge the whole octopus. <clears throat> Excuse me. Bring it to a boil. I throw in a lot of peppercorns in like a tea uh, sachet. Uh, a lot of spices like fennel seeds, coriander seeds. Do not put them directly into the water. They have to be in a strainer or in a sachet because guess what? All those tentacles on the octopus, yeah, guess what? All those little suction cups, guess what they're, guess what they're perfectly sized and shaped to do? Yeah. 
Yeah, grab onto those peppercorns, and then you're just going to be picking them out for the rest of the day. So flavor the water with that. Uh, vinegar, I like to cook it in red wine as well, so two cups of red wine for a couple quarts of water. Bring it to a boil, drop your octopus in, add some plates on top of it that you, it can help it submerge down below the, the level of the liquid. Turn the heat down to medium, low, low, medium, low, and just let it simmer for an hour to two hours until it is meltingly tender and you can pull it up and the tentacles are sort of beginning to, to fall off of the head. That's when it's done. And at that point, it's now ready to be cooked in other ways. Sure, it's absolutely delicious just as it is there. The key is to cool it down in the cooking liquid. Put the whole thing in the fridge and just let it cool down. That's going to help it to stay tender. Now, there's a lot of myths and a lot of different ideas about how to keep octopus tender. All of them work. None of them work. What I'm saying to you today, right now, may work. It's always worked for me. One time it didn't. Octopus is a bit of a mysterious creature. Uh, but generally, just that submerge, simmer on low, uh, and then let it cool in the liquid. And then when you pull it out of the liquid when it's cool, you can just pat it dry uh, and then slice it thin and sprinkle it with uh, smoked sweet paprika and serve it with boiled potatoes, uh, Spanish, the great Spanish dish, uh, pulpo gallega, uh, which is served up in the, uh, up in the north. Uh, but then also these tentacles and the, the head case uh, are perfect for saute, perfect for the grill at this point. Cook them from cold just a little bit of oil on the outside, do an herb and shallot marinade, whatever you want, throw them under the broiler. Basically what you want is to char and singe, sear that outside, that skin, that purplish skin, which by all efforts, please leave on because that is the best part. Uh, you're trying to singe or sear that outside part, whether it's in a pan or under the ambient heat of a broiler or on the grill, uh, and just warm the octopus through. You don't need to cook it again. It's already fully cooked. So. That was a whole lot right there, a uh, 10 minute answer on, uh, on squid and octopus, but it's a complex category of ingredients, uh, but one that's worth exploring. And back to the, that fresh squid, uh, when you find those, there's some great tutorials online about how to, how to clean it. Uh, the peeled frozen squid works perfectly well, but uh, by all means, try and find yourself some fresh. Octopus typically comes frozen uh, in these little briquettes basically two to four pound octopus those are absolutely wonderful i don't mess around with fresh octopus ever uh, i do, i did once and um i i literally got into a fight with it and I, because it was alive and yeah the frozen ones are great they're really great and uh easy to cook easy to thaw easy to find as well and affordable hey thanks so much appreciate your question all right, another question from Katie regarding, oh, uh, the ahi tuna burger that I used last week in the grilling vegetables section when I was talking about uh, alternative burgers and, well, really about uh, how to structure a burger so that it is, oh, it is at its very best. But um, again, I wanted to thank my friend Thomas Kraft at Norpak Fisheries. He's been a longtime friend uh, as well as a really an admired colleague. Uh, out in Norpak Fisheries, they've been leading the way and visionary in terms of their approach to sustainability and traceability. And like a lot of other companies in the seafood world in COVID times, are reinventing and reimagining new products uh, for the direct to consumer market and the retail market. And I want to thank them again for providing some uh, support in helping us to produce the webinar last week. And Katie, thank you for your question. So I have another box that he had sent me. It, it's just a really cool product. I mean, it's it's um, it's ahi tuna. So, uh, Marine Stewardship Council certified fishery, so it's sustainable coming out of the Cook Islands, and uh, well, th there's the package. Uh, I mean, they're absolutely delicious, and, and I was describing them. They're made with ahi tuna, fresh number one grade ahi tuna that's blended with quinoa. Uh, I believe there's some avocado oil in there as well as some. Uh, some greens, I think Swiss chard and uh, beet powder. And unlike a lot of the other burgers, the, the non-meat burgers that are hitting the markets these days, uh, <laughs> some of those things have 35 ingredients 
all of which are polysyllabic and like six syllables each. Um, you know, when I make a veggie burger or an alternative burger, that's how I do it. I mean, you, you take really great, you know, base. What's your base? Is it black bean? Is it ahi tuna? Is it salmon? And then you use just enough, uh, you know, I don't really use binders. I you know, complementary ingredients that really elevate the whole thing. And, you know, that's what I found with these. Um, they're just a really great quality product that I I was really pleased to try. And I even developed some, some recipes for their website. So if you check out Fresh Seas, dot com uh, you'll see a couple of recipes that I've got in there not just for the burger but uh, I did one also for an enchilada with these uh, with butternut squash which was really good uh, stuffed pepper and uh, what else did I do a lettuce wrap so uh, just a really cool versatile product um, and well uh, we saw the question came in a little early and uh, reached out to Tom and they're they're actually going to run a little special for uh, any of you they want to go. Go to freshcheese.com and, and if you buy a couple boxes of these, uh, I think four boxes or something, uh, they'll send you a, a, a poke kit as well, which is just really cool. But um, yeah, super high quality stuff. And when it comes to those blended burgers or the alternative burgers, I mean, tuna, uh, that's, that's like perfect fish to be doing with this, uh, to do that with. Um, and you just end up with, a, with flavor and texture and meatiness. Uh, you know, I, I did one with the sockeye salmon uh, during the, the sockeye salmon webinar as well. And uh, you know, it's fish like that that stand up, that have some, some good flavor, they have good textural contrast from the outside to the inside, some moisture to them uh, that really work and the fattiness. And well, you also get the health benefits too from that. So Katie, thanks for your question about it. So again, freshseas.com. I don't mean to be giving you an advertisement for them, but hey, uh, I appreciate their support and you know, I would appreciate you supporting them because they are a great quality product and from a leader in the field. So, and uh, hey, have you ever made a veggie burger? Any of you? Have you ever tried? I made one. Uh, yeah, I made a really, really good one one time. But uh, yeah, I'm curious to see, curious to hear if any of you have a recipe that you really like. And what's, what's sort of your base binder? Have you ever made a tuna one uh, or salmon? Or do you use black beans? What do you use? So, yeah, let me know. We'll discuss it. All right. Cheers. All right. So we answered most of the big questions that I've got. So I got just a few other lingering questions from uh, weeks past uh, or some small ones that I just wanted to answer. So from last week, uh, from Harriet, if I don't have grape leaves, can I steam fish on the barbecue in aluminum foil? Last week I did a, or two weeks ago, I did uh, some sockeye salmon wrapped in grape leaves. Uh, actually I actually did it in kelp leaves and then just put it on the grill. And the purpose of this is that those grape leaves, the, the wrapping singes, sears, smokes a little bit, it flavors the, as the heat penetrates. So you get this wonderful soft aroma added to your fish, but also the fish is protected beautifully. And so it ends up being moist and delicious with a hint of that grill flavor, but also the addition of the, the sourness of the grape leaves or the umami richness of the kelp. Uh, can you steam it in barbecue on the aluminum or in aluminum foil on the barbecue? Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, quite honestly, I, I would rather just do it in, inside uh, at that point. It's a little easier just to steam it in, in the oven or in, uh, in a toaster oven or just to poach it if that's what you're aiming for. But if you're cooking other things and you know, you're, you're having a grilled meal, absolutely. Put a piece of fish in some aluminum foil. You want to have uh, some oil on the fish, season the fish, and then just put it in. What you need to do is create just an encasement so that the moisture of the fish stays trapped within this little pouch. And so you're steaming it in its own juices and it becomes those juices that render out become its own sauce mixed with the olive oil or the butter, whatever you put in there. You know, chopped fresh herbs like tarragon is wonderful. So absolutely, that's a great way to do it. However, I have found that foil, if it touches fish like flounder, uh, and I've seen this particularly, huh, there goes the neighborhood groundhog. I've been trying to get rid of him for a long time. Uh, particularly with flatfish, flounder, and sole. Uh, aluminum foil can give it a very tinny taste to it. It is sort of this, this piercing, 
uh, metallic flavor that, that kind of gets you here. It's, it's just not very good. So uh, salmon works well for that. Snapper, grouper, meatier fish with a little bit more flavor to them uh, work better than the flaky white flesh fish for that purpose. Uh, if you're going to do a flaky white flesh fish on the grill like this, you know, use parchment paper. Use a couple of layers of parchment paper uh, and do it away from the heat so that you're not burning the paper directly, but you're still getting that ambient heat from the grill. So give that a try. Cheers. Thanks for the question. All right. Uh, from Melina, my partner is celiac and cannot have gluten or corn. Would appreciate some help with gluten-free baking. This ruby does not seem to cover this, but... Uh, I, I believe they do. That is not my specialty at all, but I would urge you to go check out uh, the Forks Over Knives course that they offer, uh, as well as the Vegan Desserts course uh, that Fran offers through Ruby, uh, which I, I, I know both are really great and have significant content on that. So, yeah, I hope you find it. So, and to that point, anyone else is listening, I have my own course called Seafood Literacy on Ruby, which is uh, a great partnership. And please check out the course, because if you want to be a seafood master chef and actually just use seafood to become a pretty dang good chef in all aspects, the Seafood Literacy course is a great thing. So, please check it out. And while we're self agonizing you know what? I've got a lot of books, too, with great recipes. And my wife designed them, and they're beautiful, and I'm really proud of them. So, check them out. Buy them. Appreciate the support. Thanks. Okay. Uh, let's see. A couple more. Uh, will you do fruit on the grill episode? I find the sugars in fruit uh, are greatly enhanced on the grill, but could you use some pointers on best practices? Uh, from Brent. Hey, Brent. Uh, yes, fruit on the grill. I probably won't do a, a whole section, a whole webinar on it, but uh, I did have some peaches on the grill for our 4th of July one. Uh, and you're absolutely right. Uh, fruit and smoke and that low sexy seductive rumbling woody woodiness smokiness of the grill is absolutely perfect pairing uh, with fruit uh, you're not so much grilling it the way you're grilling a steak applying hot hot heat to it uh, so much as I like to put them you know, halved fruit like peaches or plums even apples uh, put them on the grill after I'm done cooking everything else and when you sit down to dinner, your fire is dying. <coughs> you close off the grill grates at the bottom to kind of choke off that fire. You put the top on. And 45 minutes later or so, when you're done with dinner over here, you've got these perfectly roasted, wonderful, caramelized, smoky peaches that are just sitting on the grill waiting for you to put vanilla ice cream and pour some stout on top of it as your dessert. Yeah, yeah. But... If you are, uh, fruit on the grill also makes for great salsas and stuff. I and mean, if you're doing grilled pineapple mixed with jalapenos or something and, and red onion uh, for fish or chicken, it, it's delicious. Uh, whether you're doing, uh, you know, little apple quarters or so tossed in olive oil and shallots, a little bit of garlic and tarragon, uh, throw those on the grill over high heat, get them charred, burned a little bit, you know, and sort of that becomes this little accompaniment to a piece of fish, especially something like salmon or grouper that has a little bit of spice, sort of a, a pungent component to it on the background. You know, it's little grilled apple quarters uh, on the side that you kind of cut and put a bite together and eat. Absolutely delicious. So, And don't, uh, don't be afraid to go savory with fruit on the grill. It doesn't have to be dessert. Hey, thanks, Brent. Appreciate you, buddy. All right. Um, Shep, just wanted to say thank you. Enjoy the class. Well, thank you, Therese. I appreciate that. Oh, that's just that's a nice comment. I appreciate you doing that. All right. Uh, do the veggies in the coals have oil on the skin? So I was roasting whole butternut squash. Uh, well, I, I didn't do that on the episode. I was doing whole onions in their skin and a whole eggplants. And I put them under the grill grate directly next to the coals. So they were touching the fire. And I did that for to make a something like a baba ganoush uh, with the eggplant. Uh, you also like an escalivada where I just peeled the skin off and, and removed the, the smoky, delicious, cooked in its own juices flesh there and just chopped it up with olive oil and, and some vinegar, the delicious you know, side dish. Uh, the onions, the outside of, and, and in both cases, well, in any case that you roast a vegetable in the fire, it has to have the skin on it. Uh, and carrots work fine too. The peel is thick enough with bigger 
but basically what you're going to do is you're going to burn the outside and you're going to have to throw it away because it, it is it is burnt to a crisp. Uh, but on the inside, that onion or that eggplant or that butternut squash is so delicious and so smoky in a unique way that only coal or ember roasting uh, can provide. Beets work m magically well uh, with such a method. So yeah, try it out. Uh, bottom line is, uh, just try it out, you know what? And hey, if it doesn't turn out or you burn it or you know it's a little undercooked and you get nervous and you, you pull it off, okay, you tried something new. I'm not into wasting food, but bottom line is, yeah, you're gonna you're gonna waste some on the outside, but the, the middle and the the inside is gonna be absolutely worth the effort. And it's a fun fun way to cook. People ask you about it. It's kind of a fun talking point. And you get more cooking out of one fire because instead of just cooking above the fire, you're you know, cooking in it. There you go. All right. But no oil. <laughs> Back to your actual question. No oil on the skins. No. Uh, they're they're going to burn and char. It doesn't need any help. And the oil is just that's just a waste of money. Hey, thanks for your question. I appreciate you. Uh, let's see. Um, with the salad that I had made, so a, a salad of red onion, mint, and uh, snap peas, would it work with uh, snow peas as well? Absolutely it would. Snow peas, yeah, I would probably cook them in two batches because you're going to have a lot more surface area in those to cook. Uh, so just make sure you're getting them spread out on the grill in a grill basket and just cook them in two batches and absolutely. And they'll cook very quickly because they're so thin. Yeah, that'd be great. All right. Um, and last question, I heard that bitter vegetables are good for your liver. And then uh, another question about how to use um, frisee or endive, those bitter greens. And do they char if they're on the grill? So I'll kind of combine those two and then say goodbye. Bitter greens good for your liver? I actually don't know that, but I will look into that. Interesting. Uh, but in terms of cooking those greens, throwing them on the grill is magic. Uh, cooking them bitter greens is magic, especially on dry heat. If you're simmering them, sauteing them in oil, you know, etc., you're just kind of wilting them down. But when you char them, when you're using dry heat, um, no oil, if just a few drops maybe, what you're doing is you're burning them. And you are turning, you are caramelizing the sugars that are in there. You're bringing them to the flavor four. So you now have this bitter green that has all of the sweetness brought out to it, uh, brought out of it to the surface, and it's now this incredibly balanced, amazing, complex, delicious ingredient that is wholly unique, interesting, adds texture, volume uh, to dishes, as well as just a, a beautiful uh, visual. Uh, and uh, yeah, so hey, try that out, especially things like frisee, frisee endive uh, is a great one to do, endive, like Belgian endives. Radicchios in particular all take really well to the grill. And you know what? If it's still a little bitter to your taste after coming off the grill or cooking them, there's always some balsamic vinegar. Cheers along. All right, friends. Hey, I really appreciate you joining me. Please, uh, today, please join me again next week. We're also going to be taking a break. Actually, you know what? I think we're going to be taking a break for the next couple of weeks for August. But uh, you'll, be, you'll hear from us when we've got a new one coming up. And in the meantime, please remember that feeding people is an act of love. And I love you so much. And thank you for all that you do to feed others, to love others. And uh, yeah, thanks so much. Bon appetit. Take care.